Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. And on this rather blustery Adelaide day, I'd like to welcome you to Vlog 25. And the title is The 3D PhD Student. Now, please don't be concerned, I'm not discussing 3D printers, and I will define what I mean about 3D PhD students shortly, but I firstly wanted to explain how we got here. The wonderful Glory has asked me to prepare some vlogs for you about how to construct an academic CV and how to write an academic job application, and I'm doing those vlogs for you at the moment. But I suddenly realised I need a scaffold, I need one more step in a vlog before we can get you there, and that's the purpose of today. What I want you to think about is how you create and how you disseminate the content that you're going to refer to and list on your CV and you're going to refer and list on your job application. So how we send yourself out into the world. So I'm going to ask you to do something that might make you a little bit uncomfortable to start. And what I'm going to ask you to do is Google yourself. So please feel free to press pause on this vlog and Google yourself now. Or just note to self at the conclusion of this vlog, please do Google yourself. And I know it's uncomfortable, it's a bit yucky, I hate doing it as well. But what I would suggest you, to you is, have a look at the first two pages of the Google Returns and see what's there, see if you're comfortable with it, and then if you can, look at the first five pages of Google Returns. Always very important to do this because every employer on the planet is going to do this. But I don't want you panicked about the results that you see because the internet is based on smoke and mirrors. And what exists right now in your Google returns will be quite radically changed through your intervention in three months. So don't be worried about what's there, but see it, understand it, and what I'm going to talk about today is how to intervene in the content that Google is finding so you can enable your career. So before we get to preparing a CV and preparing a job application, let's talk about you, the 3D PhD student. What I'm interested in is how we construct content that moves through space and time. So today's vlog is about knowledge generation, but also about knowledge dissemination. How you can meet people online and how they can meet your expertise online and think about employing you. So when I talk about the three Ds, what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about digitization, disintermediation and deterritorialization, the three Ds. Now for me, those three Ds are the punctuation of the new university, they're the punctuation of the new economy, if you will. They allow the proliferation of new ways of thinking about reading, writing and thinking, and new ways of being a public intellectual in a digital world. So we're just going to quickly go through each of the three Ds, but I particularly want you to think about how you are deploying that D in your own life and in your own work. So digitization has many characteristics. The mo most famous characteristic is that it allows content to move through space and time. This means that ideas can move at speed and that's profoundly important and wonderful for you but it also poses risks and you need to understand both. But I particularly want to configure a new way of thinking about dissemination for you. Particularly for you guys thinking about getting an academic job. How are you disseminating, how are you sharing the teaching feedback that you receive? So when you get a great student evaluation, what are you doing with that document? Are you going, oh, that's nice, and putting it in a folder? Why aren't you scanning it? Why aren't you loading it up to academia.edu under a heading that says teaching evaluations? How will future employers know that you are a good teacher? Remember, this is an evidence-driven practice. If you're going to get a job, it's not going to be on a vibe or if somebody likes you. It's got to be an evidence-based decision. So start to give future employers that 
evidence that shows you're a great teacher. So yes, teaching evaluation, student evaluation is important. If you've developed fantastic curriculum or a really outstanding assignment, then again, scan that digitise it and upload it to academia.edu. You can then refer to it on your CV and refer to it in job applications. Remember, I also had an earlier vlog that introduced the teaching philosophy to you. Now, I know a lot of you wrote that. Hi, Laurie. I know a lot of you wrote that document. Why don't you, again, PDF it and load it up to academia.edu. Once it's up there, you can link to it in multiple platforms. I remember <laughs> I did an interview last year for a job I didn't take and one of the reasons I didn't take that job was on the interview panel was a pretty random guy in can I say not a very nice suit either it was a bit of an aggressive guy but he asked me a question sort of pretending that if you work in a university you work in a bank and he said to me to try and sort of upset me a little bit in the interview have you got a 360 degree review of your work and I went absolutely I had a 360 degree review boom I had a 360 degree review done a year ago that has been uploaded to academia.edu because I believe in transparency and accountability and that document as I'm sure you know was linked as a footnote in my job application so I'm interested why you'd ask the question because I actually cited it in the job application. <laughs> So digitization allows you to share some very interesting documents over space and over time. Remember, job applications, grants, all sorts of awards are evidence driven. Give people the evidence to hire you. Give them the evidence to give you that grant, that award. So my homework that I want to give you all this week before we do our next couple of sessions is start to think about how you document your successes. Digitally, how have you shown the great success that you've had in your career? Start to think about how you could capture that data and disseminate it in new ways. Okay, that was 1D. From the digital, we move to D, territorialization. Now, in the early 1990s, Sherry Turkle produced one of the best known books in this early history of the internet and internet studies, and it was called Life on the screen. And that book really captured, I think, the very meaning of deterritorialization. We now have a life that is on the screen, very separate from our analog body and our analog existence. So deterritorialization refers to the way in which particular media platforms and applications de-emphasize our positioning in space and time and reconfigure us in new ways in the online environment. So that means you could be in Adelaide, you could be in Alice Springs, hi everyone in Alice Springs, but you could be having a Skype conversation with somebody in Jakarta. Deterritorialization. You don't share space, but you share time. So the telephone, the satellite were the 20th century manifestations of deterritorialization but the internet and its applications are the clear archetypes in our century. What the digitized screen does is disconnects our body from different ways of thinking about identity. So the question is, how are you going to use that for your academic life? This means that thousands, tens of thousands of people who never meet your analog self get to know you via LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. So the question is, how are you enabling your research and your academic profile in and for this new environment? How are you traveling beyond the local environment? How are you becoming more than world famous in Adelaide? You need to get your work so far beyond Adelaide that the question is, how are you going to do it? Now, deterritorialization matters to supervisors because all sorts of different meetings can be enacted. There's a whole series of students that I've supervised in the last six, seven years that have been supervised via Skype. I hardly see them, but we have a weekly meeting via Skype. I also conduct examinations very regularly through Skype. So it's transforming doctoral supervision and doctoral examination. But what about you? Well, you're able to create a whole series of new peer-to-peer -peer relationships. If you think about the Write Bunch, that wonderful writing community, 
we have on Friday mornings. Guys, that is an example of deterritorialization. You guys are all over the planet and we come together for half an hour on a Friday morning. Very important. Also, all sorts of new support systems are available to you online. I'm thinking particularly about all the PhD support groups that exist on Facebook. So if you are feeling isolated, always know, email me anytime, deterritorialization, I'm there. But also use those Facebook support groups. There are thousands of them. And if I can do a particular shout out to one of my favorite group of people, the OWLs, the Older, Wiser Learners, fantastic group of PhD students who offer some of the best support I've ever seen anywhere in the world and thank you all as always for your wonderful support of me. You are terrific. So yes, support matters and I'm never underestimating support. If you're feeling isolated, use the online environment, find some new mates. That's brilliant. But I particularly want to focus on how we connect your digital academic self with prospective employers. So let me give you an example. In fact, this is an example I'm about to do, so you can watch me do it in real time. But say you're about to deliver a conference paper. Bang. Immediately what I want you to do is go to academia.edu and they have a special little portal where you can actually log the conference paper, the title, where it is, the time and when, all that sort of stuff. That's fantastic. So you must do that. But I want you to take one more step. Using your mobile phone and a free app, why not record a 20 second or a 30 second sonic or visual file that provides a little advertisement for that conference presentation. Firstly, you might attract some new people to get there because they get to have a look at you, that's terrific. But also remember, a conference paper is analog. Once you've done it, it's over. So what I'm trying to help you do is find ways digitally to log that moment in your academic life. So when it's over, people will know what happened and what that topic was about and they'll also see your high level communication skills. So do that for me. So let's do our final and key term. Yes, we are there. Wow. Disintermediation. Disintermediation. Disintermediation is a characteristic of peer-to-peer -peer networks. That means like Facebook, that means like LinkedIn, like Twitter. What happens is links are removed from the traditional supply and distribution chain. So that means the multiple layers that exist between a producer, say, of content and a consumer of content they're collapsed, disintermediation. So those multiple layers involved in the designing, the creation of content, the branding, the marketing, the selling, all those layers suddenly disappear. In other words, the person who, say, would make lipstick wouldn't sell the lipstick, yeah? That's, a, that's the old-fashioned supply economy. You designed lipstick, you had the chemistry, but you weren't the person who sold it. Similarly, you could design a piece of furniture, but you're not the person that sells it in the showroom. So in the online environment, those layers have now collapsed. And in the analog pre-Web 2 environment, the best example of this was always, say, a musician wrote a song in their basement. They would then maybe get picked up by an A&R representative in a music company who would record it in a professional studio. That song would be engineered and mastered. It would be pressed onto vinyl. That vinyl would be shipped to a record store and somebody would sell that song, right? That's the old-fashioned way of thinking about supply and demand in the industrial age, if you will. But through the last decade of disintermediation, let's think about what's happened to music particularly. It's a great example. So a guy records a song in his basement, he then mixes that on the software that's resident on his home computer, he then uploads that to iTunes where customers can buy it. That's the new model for music generation. So therefore content originators, that is you, we develop content, content originators and business businesses can deal with their customers directly. We're no longer mediated by wholesalers or retailers. Now you might be saying, well that's all very interesting tariff for the music industry or publishing, but how does that impact on you? And the answer is hugely. You no longer have to wait for publishers to contact you. You no longer have to wait hoping that an employer will notice you. You can be 
proactive and you can set up your own digital shop front to show your wares. So this means therefore that everything fabulous that you do, and you are fabulous so everything's fabulous, everything fabulous that you do in teaching and research, I want you to capture it for me and display it to an array of audiences. So use academia.edu, use ResearchGate if that's your vibe, use ORCID. ORCID's becoming increasingly interesting. I think we're going to do a vlog on ORCID in the next little bit. But we need to recognise that disintermediation has transformed higher education. In the old days, 20 years ago, the university system used to be based on patronage. So basically white men who went to a posh university hired other white men who went to a posh university. That's the Oxbridge way. Now don't get me wrong, that stuff does still happen. But patronage is being cut up quite a lot by digitisation, deterritorialisation and disintermediation. It's agitating and it's collapsing a lot of the assumptions and the power structures. So disintermediation is a flat model. The layering, the brokering agents are starting to be reduced. Now that has many causes. One of them of course is Google. Google not only allowed the proliferation of information, that's one thing, but it allowed it to be found through an intuitive search engine. The challenge we now have though is that our 3Ds are being managed by one R and that is re-intermediation. So that flat model that's existing in academic life means that yes, you can write something and people interested in that can find it. That's tremendous. But new middle men are being constructed in this model. So Apple, for example, Amazon is another great example, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. These are the new re-intermediating agents. So disintermediation is great for doctoral students because it allows you to find new pathways to information and new publishing opportunities. It also allows you to reorganise the relationship between you and your supervisor because as I said the power structures start to fragment a bit. In the old days you had that sort of godlike relationship with your supervisor. Well today you can tweet four, five, six, ten of the best scholars on the planet right now and so you meet all sorts of new people that singular power relationship has gone yes it is a time of opportunity certainly mates still give jobs to mates lots of jobs around the world are supposedly advertised but are already filled we know all of that stuff it is absolutely dreadful I never do that I never will do that I ask every single one of you as the future leaders in higher education please remember always have job applications that are open and transparent and accountable. When you do that, you always get the best person. You don't get a mate, you get the person best suited for that job. But what we have to make sure is that employers find you. And while there is an explosion of digital in information, we need to code it. We need the metadata to be really strong. So tag with keywords, tag with hashtags. So there is no doubt through the three Ds we've talked about, guys and gals, higher education is transforming. And just in case I haven't convinced you, I want to just tell a final story if I can. For those of you who think that maybe higher education hasn't changed too much and great things can't happen. I get a lot of emails every day when students express great sadness and think, will anything good ever happen? Well, let me just share one story with you that again, I've never told anybody that just shows you through this new online environment, great things can happen. Now, in the year 2007, I wrote a book called the University of Google. Here it is, the University of Google. Now, 2007 was the period when social media was emerging very strongly. Web 2 was starting to re reach popular cultural currency. So, of course, I could use the word Google in a book title. What was also happening, though, is open access journals run by academics rather than publishers was proliferating. And in that year, I had just arrived in England as a new professor. 
and you know I was pretty well known in Australia before I left, won a lot of awards, very well known, all that sort of stuff. But when I arrived in England, I was starting from nothing. Nobody knew who I was at all. So what I did was I submitted a book proposal to a British publisher and two outstanding professors, two of the greatest scholars on the planet, two leaders in the field of higher education studies and the information society agreed to be the referees for this book. Can you imagine? Oh my goodness. And they absolutely loved it. One of them described it as the greatest book of the last decade. We had this incredible, I, I'd never received referee reports like it ever in my entire life. I, I still think they're probably my best ones. But they were so incredibly intellectually generous, so incredibly honest. And one of the professor's reviews was so effusive that he actually took a paragraph and apologised. He said, look, I've never written a review like this before. And I just want to make clear, I don't know who this woman is, okay? I've never met her, never seen her at a conference. And I've just Googled her and she's already written eight books and 120 refereed articles and I'm really embarrassed because I'd never heard of her and to make my embarrassment even worse he continued not only do I not know who she is the referees the researchers that she talked about in this book I didn't recognize either and I didn't even recognize the journals that were being cited in the footnotes very powerful thing for a, an elite scholar to say he made the comment that he was an expert in the information society, but this book was needed to connect his older scholarship with the new ways of thinking about information and knowledge. So the, the University of Google did incredibly well. You can imagine, I've just arrived and within weeks I'd received these referee reports and I was beyond excited. And because of their intellectual generosity and because this book got published, I was featured in the array of British newspapers. I got a feature article in The Guardian, which is unbelievable, which is still in my first two pages of Google returns. Amazing. And through that publicity, the Times Higher hired me as a columnist. Now, I have no doubt... I think, I have to ask my boss this, but I've no doubt that if I hadn't done all that work with the Times Higher Education, I probably wouldn't have the job that I have now. So as you can see, this is what the 3D higher education system can give you. New voices, new views, new journals, new ways for colleagues to find out more about you, and new ways to disseminate your research. So what I want you to do, your homework for me, is to diagnose your engagement with the three Ds. How digital are you? Are you managing deterritorialization? How are you managing the new re-intermediation strategies? I want you to prepare yourself for your next analog step in your career. And as always, I wish you love, light, and peace. And on this blustery day, we got through it. Tea out.